Welcome, okay. welcome to the Church of God, and thank you for joining us today. It sun is shining, and it's just a hair warmer, so we can appreciate that. And I was going through some old pictures and ran across Route 66 pictures. Wow. We used to stop at all the old places on Route 66. So I'm going to read a short verse from Psalm 66. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of your greatness, your power, your enemies will give obedience to you. And all the earth will worship you. Thank you, Lord, for all your works. Thank you for this beautiful world we live in. And thank you that we can gather together here in your name and praise and bless and sing to you, making a joyful noise. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. 
next hymn is going to be up on the screen. It's Whosoever Meaneth Me. salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations of the earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the people praise you. The earth has yielded its produce God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him and live in peace. Amen. Good morning, good morning. So glad we're all here this morning. And those of you online, we just thank you so much for joining us. 
At this time, we're going to take some prayer requests, and we want to thank that the Beecham kids are all feeling good today. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. So, and we've got some visitors. Thank you so much for joining us also, and I want to just thank you guys all for your prayers and support on healing. Keep, keep it up. So, what else do we have that we can thank the Lord for? Come on, guys. Money? <laughs> well... This is the start of a new year. We've got new choices and new decisions to make. Our resolutions of poverty already run out because it's the 17th. <laughs> but one thing we can resolve to do is thank the Lord for all he's given us because he truly has. And I gotta tell you, he has blessed me endlessly. Amen. Um, also, just to let everybody know, the Senior Center is open to anybody who wants to have lunch. Um, we have had a wonderful turnout. We just want to thank the community of Beatty and also travelers coming through. Uh, now, Monday they're closed because of the holiday, but um, it's just it's exciting to see, even in all this COVID mess, that something good is still happening and, and uh, seniors are being fed. So if you know somebody who's needing meals or anything like that, either let myself know or call the Senior Center and let them know too. So we still need to continue to pray for Dorothy. Um, her leg still is not healing, uh, part of its complications of diabetes, um, but she's now getting out and about a little bit more so, so that's good. Um, Thomas has a letter on the back that he sent some time ago, if you guys haven't seen that, um, please check with that. Also be praying for Karen Grover. Her and Bill are just really struggling health-wise. So. And I'm also excited because the teens, we need to get more teens involved, but the teens are um, doing different things um, to show appreciation for the seniors, but um, they're coming up with different crafty things, things to give the seniors, just so people realize that there's a group of people out there praying and thinking of them. So if you'd like to participate with that, let us again know or let Stephanie know and um, we can help because I know there's always cost involved when you're making gifts. So. Anything else? Stephanie? Miss Elaine is back. Miss Elaine is back. <laughs> Jerry? Thank you guys for praying. <laughs> You're welcome. Jerry? Yeah, after 17 days in heavy rain up in the northwest, I know we're in a drought down here, but you have no idea what a joy it is <laughs> to see the sunshine every day. <laughs> oh, yeah. So in other words, in 17 days of rain, you were like, okay, we are not going through Noah's, Noah's flood again, right? And it was 17 days of the rain like we get when we get it. Uh-huh. Deluge. Yeah. I didn't need a car. I needed a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you're back. Really are glad you're back. Anything else? We need to bring for Andy and Wanda. They should be heading back. Um, they took a weekend vacation. But needed to get out of town. All right, let's go before our seat. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the way you're working in this body of believers. We thank you for allowing us to share fellowship together, and even in this stressful time. Father, I just pray that you continue to be with our military families. We just thank you for those who are standing in harm's way to keep us safe. I continue to just pray, too, for the housing needs in Beatty and continual medical healing. And, Father, I just also, too, pray for our students and help them get back to a semblance of routine. And I continue to pray for uh, May and her family and the Taylor family, um, Jay Lynn's family. There's just so many, and Crystal's family also. I just thank you so much that you love us. And, Father, I thank you for the rain in the Northwest, but you can send some our way. And mm -hmm. I just thank you so much that you care for us beyond anything we can even imagine. Even in all the trials that we deal with, you are constantly there before us. You are the powerful one. I also, too, just continue to be with Michael and the loss of his brother and, and other families who have lost loved ones. We thank you for who you are, for this beautiful day, for the creation, for just the way you protect and provide for us. In all God's children said, Amen. Amen.
Our next hymn is page 510, Heaven Came Down. So here's what Ephesians says. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his might. Put on the full armor of God so you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authority, <coughs> against the powers of darkness, and the world against the spiritual evil forces. Therefore, put on the full armor of God 
so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which is which you can distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. So, a couple of things here, guys. You're going to help me out. Remember we talked a little bit in Sunday school. All right? So the very first thing that we need armor for is for those arrows. Those things that happen that cause us trouble, called sin. Remember some sin? Mm -hmm. All right, Julius, what is the sin? Whining. Whining. Ooh, yeah, we talked about sin as whining or complaining. Anola, what's a sin? Um, uh, not listening. Not listening. Yeah, that's a bad one. William, how about you? Disobeying. Well, you know what? There's arrows, and we're going to get more to some of these arrows. But one of the arrows says, me first. Ever been there? Ah, mm -hmm. uh, me. Me too. Lying. You ever lied? Yeah. yeah, me too. Ever been afraid? Yep. Fear is, God doesn't want us to be fearful. Ever been angry? No. Oh, yes. Satan likes to get us angry. In fact, he tried really hard this morning, and it almost worked. Um, ever said something you should have said about somebody else called gossip? Yeah, we've, we've done that before. Have you ever been rude? Have you? Kind of. Yeah. Kind of? No, it's more than kind of. <laughs> have you ever been greedy? You want more than what you need? Greed is also a sin. It's some of those little arrows that Satan puts at us. Oh, we already had complaining. What about jealousy? Yes. You've been jealous? Yeah, me too. And another one is being regretful and shameful. These are things that Satan throws at us. These are the kind of darts and arrows that Satan throws at us. But we have the armor of God to help us. And one of the things that helps me remember the armor of God, you guys ready? You got ready? Got ready? You're going to have to stand up because everybody's going to see you. Stand up there, up on the stage, and get your book ready. What page are we doing first? The black line. All right, you got it ready? Yeah. Singing songs helps me stay grounded. So here we go. My heart was full black with sin until the Savior came in. Turn the page. Turn the page. Got it, Nolly? Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, William, let them do it. They're big enough. Okay, ready? My heart was black with sin until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed me white as snow. And in God's word, I'm told, I'll walk the streets of gold. Oh, wonderful, wonderful day, he washed my sin away. Oh, me, I forgot to go high. Oh, that's okay. Thank you very much. Now you can practice it with Mom, right? Another time. Yeah. And just remember, when Satan's throwing those darts at you, great people, find a simple song that you can sing to enjoy, bringing yourself back in line with God. We have one more song we're going to enjoy. Page 605, Living for Jesus. You can stand if you want to.
uh, pastor. We don't have a pastor here right now. Um, we've been taking turns bringing devotionals, and it's my Sunday, and I've been going through Hebrews, and as not a pastor, it's been one of the hardest things I've ever done. I thought Romans was going to be the tough one, and Mr. A and I started doing Romans back, I guess at the end of last year, um, I thought it was going to be difficult, and it was, because there's a lot there, and um, and then I'm sure there was a lot there that I didn't even get, but Hebrews is rough. It's been really rough for me, um, and uh, a lot of times, like, like I was saying, like, I think that was uh, two Sundays ago when I talked last, um, I start by reading through the chapter, and I start with Hebrews, and I'm like, there's really nothing here, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then I mope and whine and cry about it, and then I, I read through my J. Vernon McGee book, which I've been relying on pretty heavily, especially in Hebrews, and um, he usually points something out, and he did in this one, and I was like, okay, so my notes went from one page to two pages, or maybe three thanks to him, um, but I need between five and seven in order that we don't get out, because nobody wants to go home early, I know. Um, so, and then, you know, then I sit down and think about it, and, and there's so much to it by the time I'm done. Um, well, we're probably going to get out two or three. <laughs> um, so we were, we ended in um, kind of in the middle of a thought, and uh, we're going to start Hebrews 6, but I'm going to actually start in Hebrews 5, verse 12, and then just read through Hebrews 6, 3, because these chapters are broken, I notice, it, especially in Hebrews, they seem to be broken a, a little bit in, in the middle of thoughts. Although everything in this flows from one thought to the next, I can see how it would happen. Hebrews 5.12 For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permits. Perfection in here is a word. That another problem that I think I have with Hebrews is, is the, um, the way that the different words are used. Like I said the last time that I talked, these words are used. And we think of perfection as being something that has no flaw. And, uh, you know, something that we will only gain in heaven. And then last Sunday, they were, they were using terminology that we tend to use towards referring to being saved in walking in the Christian life. And perfection here, I believe, means completion and speaks of a fuller knowledge of the things of God. So, like I've said every Sunday since this started, um, this was written for the Jews of the first century, and the author is warning them not to return to their old ways. Their old ways were temple sacrifice, the laying on of hands was when the when you had to put your hand on the animal as it was sacrificed. Um, the doctrine of baptisms is is uh, like washing the ceremonial washing, and the resurrection of the dead. If you remember, the Sadducees didn't believe that there was a resurrection of the dead. I'm not really sure. I think they just thought that it was best to do the best thing that you could in this life, and then it was over, and you left a good a good uh, memory, I guess. But these are, and, and eternal judgment, these, even if we look at them, these are the things that we do in order to obey God and in order to be saved, the, you know, you, that you have to understand them in order to be saved, the resurrection of the dead, and um, starting with Jesus, of course, and eternal judgment is what we're fleeing just to be saved. But this goes on, this is a foundation, and he wants to build on a foundation, but he doesn't want to build on the foundation that they were uh, attending, the, the first century Jews were 
having a hard time not going back to the temple because they had been raised that you had to do these different sacrifices and everything. And the new foundation that they should be building on is Jesus Christ. So now, starting at verse 4, follows one of what I consider to be the hardest sections of the New Testament to understand or to come to, come to terms with. And I'm going to read that through verse 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good works of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. This section is used, I think, uh, quite frequently by people who believe that you can lose your salvation. And so I'm going to go into that. Without going into it too deep, we don't believe that here. Um, we believe that once you're saved, you're, you're saved. Um, John 10, 27 through... 29 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So you can't lose your salvation for the same reason that you can't gain your salvation, because you didn't do it. It's a gift of God. You can't give it back for the same reason that you couldn't get it in the first place because there's nothing that you could do. Um, Jesus says in here, my father has given them to me. It's not they prayed a prayer or they sacrificed these sacrifices or they lived a pretty good life. It's my father gave them to me. And then Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Never perish is pretty, that's pretty permanent. <laughs> Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And I think uh, nowadays, at least, and also like specifically as Protestants in America, maybe, we not too many people believe that someone else has a whole lot of say in your salvation. Like, someone else is not going to take away your salvation uh, or, you know, excommunicate you or anything like that. So the real question becomes, can I give back my salvation? And the answer is no. So, moving on. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's, two, there's only two reasons that anybody would ever give anything back that I can think of, and one is that it's broken, and the second is that you don't want it. So taking the first part first, is there a sin that's so bad that God won't forgive it? And the answer is yes. It's called blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and there's a lot of opinions about what this means, and I'm not going to give them all to you, um, even though it is an interesting study. Um, as a teenager, I was sure that I had committed that sin because, you know, as an American teenager, I was pretty sure I was the baddest person ever, and I wasn't. I was like a nerdy as a kid. I, that's hard to believe, I know, but, um, but you know, that's something that Satan uses in our hearts. You, if you talk to people about Jesus, they're like, oh man, I've done stuff so bad that God's never imagined the stuff that I did, you know? I'm like, that's been around for a while. He's been watching people. And, and, and it's, it's uh, kind of irritating and, and like offensive that this person thinks that they're that bad. That's, that's actually arrogance, to think that you're so bad that, that I'm going to be shocked. And you want, you know, I think a lot of these people really want you to be shocked by how horrible they are. And um, God has saved worse people than, than them and saved worse people than me. Um, but also, you know, it's not the clearest, or wasn't, at least then to me, what this meant. And I think reading about it in context, it's pretty clear, especially in Mark. So I'm going to read Mark 3, 20 through 30 to get some context around this idea of a sin that God won't forgive. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went and laid hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the disciples who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. 
No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter, they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal con condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. And I think verse 30 is the key, because they said he has an unclean spirit. The scribes, these people, the Jewish uh, religious leaders, had said that Jesus was casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. This is taking something that the Holy Spirit had done, and it's attributing that act to Satan. First of all, Jesus, as he often did, shows logically how idiotic that statement is. Why would Satan cast out demons? Now, in my mind, I think maybe this is a big ploy, you know, to, to convince people that, you know, I mean, I, I could see later on um, some, of, some of the, well, you know, the Jesus also warned us about false, um, false shepherds and false teachers. And with these people, in order to gain our trust or our, um, to us as followers, would they cast out demons? Just like, oh, here's a spare demon, you know, we'll just cast him out and then everybody will see it and then they'll start following me. But Jesus says, first of all, that's not, not probably the best way um, because I don't know that demons just possess people at random. There's usually, I think, a purpose for it. And then Jesus also basically tells us that this won't happen. This is not how Satan does business. He knows Satan. Again, he's been around for a long time. <laughs> And he knows Satan, and he's saying, this isn't how he works. And then second, he warns us. This is a warning to us not to attribute acts of the Holy Spirit to Satan. But this is something that I think a, a Christian who's indwelled by the Holy Spirit couldn't do, um, certainly wouldn't want to do, and would be protected from doing. But it's something that I think we, we should be aware of. Now, looking at the second reason that you might want to give something back because you don't want it, uh, if a person wants to lose their salvation, then they were never saved. And I know that's a semantic thing. I used to think, like, because when you would, like, ask questions in church growing up and, and ask the pastor, can I lose my salvation? And he'd say no. And he'd say, well, I know such and such a person. They went to church their whole life. They, they seemed to be living for Jesus, and then they didn't. And they're like, well, they were never saved. But I knew that person, and I knew that that person thought that they were saved. And that's, I think, one of the one of the things that we have to realize is that we lie to ourselves all the time. And we accept lies. Every time we turn on the TV, we believe a lie. And um, so it, I think it's possible for people to believe, to think that they believe in Jesus and not. And I think that's why Philippians 2.12 tells us, Paul speaking to the Philippians says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So, no, I don't think you can lose your salvation as the, as the short answer. And, and um, there, there is work that goes into this. We're, that's the thing about Hebrews, and I think Romans deals more with salvation and, and how to be saved. And Hebrews is dealing more with this business of working out your salvation. And it's something that's like really offensive to us, I think, because um, we'll get into it more later, but just this idea of we've been taught so much that works can't save you that we've come to despise works. And the Bible does not despise good works. But this leads us to figure out what this passage means. And I'll go back and kind of, the passage that we're talking about is the part about, um, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. And I have to give, uh, you know, I didn't know when I started reading this, I was like, well, I'm going to have a, that's going to be a short devotional because I have no idea what this means. Um, and, and I knew that if, you know, there's different, he goes through J. Vernon McGee. Okay, so I, here we are again. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm relying on him. But he went through and he said this is what he had been taught. In college, he had been taught this does mean that you know, people lose their salvation, he had been taught. It doesn't mean that you can lose your salvation. It, it's false converts. And he said he was never satisfied with any of those answers. And then he read 
an article that was written by a man named Dr. J.D. Roswell, or Roel, Roel. Um, he was a Canadian, of all things. I mean, who would have thought that a Canadian would teach us something? I'm from Michigan, so you have to make fun of Canadians at every, every possible chance. And I'm sure they do make fun of us, too. Anyways, he read this article by this guy, and he said, that's the answer. That's, that's the most, to him, was the most logical conclusion. And he points out that there are a lot of really highly respected preachers who preach different than this, and um, theologians who, who believe some other answer to this. But Dr. Roll says that this passage is not speaking about losing your salvation, but about losing your reward as a Christian. So like I said, we spend a lot of time either talking about or listening to people saying that you can't be saved by good works. And that's true. That our good works are like filthy rags, and that's also true. But to the point that we almost start to despise good works. And the problem is that this ignores a lot of the scriptures. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The thing is that we're saved. If we're saved, we're saved. And that makes Satan mad. And um, the best that he can do with us now, he can't take away our salvation because Jesus said that no one can take us from his hand. But what he can do is rob us of our reward and make us ineffective followers of Jesus. He can prevent us from sharing the gospel with other people so that more souls are lost. And he does this by telling us that we don't need to work for the Lord. We, get, we hear this, and, and it's true that, we, that there's nothing that we can do to please God, but um, that is, that's not entirely true, because let me, I'm going to jump ahead in my notes now that I'm there. Um, basically, there's nothing you can do to be saved, but once you're saved, then good works come into, come into the equation. Beforehand, they mean nothing. And afterwards, they mean everything. There's nothing we need to do to gain God's forgiveness except believe, but there's still a lot that God expects from us. And for more information, see all of the parables. 1 Corinthians 3 9 says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So Paul's pointing out in Corinthians, this, this, even these unwise workers, the people that are building with hay and straw and wood, they are, they are saved. Wanting to be saved is actually a selfish act if you think about it. If your goal is to not go to hell, and if you believe in Jesus, then you're good. But that's not, that's not what it's all about. The Royal Mail ship, RMS Titanic, was the largest ship afloat at 2.19 a.m. on April 15, 1912. There were 2,224 people on board about roughly a minute later. Technically, it wasn't entirely floating at that time. Uh, about a minute later, it wasn't the biggest ship afloat. Um, 1,514, or 68% of the people on board died. There was a problem with the lack of lifeboats, lifeboats due to um, not the best laws, and also lifeboats aren't pretty, so the designers didn't want to have a whole bunch of them cluttering up the ship. But I always think to myself, if I was on the Titanic, would wanting to get into a lifeboat be heroic? That's not a very heroic act. Most people wanted to get in lifeboats. Most people were locked below decks where they couldn't get out so that the people who paid the most could get into the lifeboats. If somehow you were in the water, which was 28 degrees at the time, 
and someone shouted at us just to reach out our hands so that someone else could pull us out of the water, would that be making a decision, really? I mean, it would in the fact that you have to reach your hand up, but I don't think too many people wouldn't reach their hand up if, the, if someone pointed them in, in, in the direction, told them, just raise your hand. I think most people would do it. Now, if you're in that lifeboat, and um, let's see, if you're in the lifeboat, did, first of all, did you do any works to be saved? Your works didn't really matter before that, did they? You certainly weren't weren't impressing anybody by letting someone pull you out of the water. But if you see someone floating by, and there's room in your lifeboat, and you don't tell them to raise their hand so that someone can pull them out of the water, what kind of a person would that make you? Before being saved, what we did didn't matter. We were waiting to be saved. And after we were saved, what we did mattered because we were saved, and we could help other people. Dr. McGee says it this way, before you were born again, works do not enter in because you cannot bring them to God. He won't accept them. And then he continues later to say, now that you have been saved, you are to show forth by your good works before the world that you are redeemed to, to God. So he thinks, and I now think, that this passage is talking about your testimony as a Christian. Everybody sins. We all sin. But if you're living in sin, you have no testimony. And this verse warns that if you do that, and if you do fall away, you can permanently damage not only your testimony, but I think your relationship with God. Dr. McGee uses uh, an example that I think uh, I probably would have come up with myself because I've been going to enough different churches to go to a church where the pastor ended up, he was a good preacher, and he was a nice guy, and he ended up having an affair. And he can't undo that. There's no coming back from that. He could move away. And if he goes to a new town, somebody's going to find him and be like, oh, you're that guy. And as judgmental as that might seem, people will, people will point out, uh, they'll point him out judgmentally for the rest of his life while defending their own sin by quoting Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. But we're not talking about judging someone. We're looking at someone and we're saying, this person preached the gospel for years and then they fell, and, and this, I think what this verse is talking about is that um, you really, you've really done some permanent damage there. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't think that that man should be allowed to preach again. Um, and I, I wouldn't go to his church if he did. Uh, I, I do think he's still saved, you know? I mean, not this specific, I've, I've, it's long, long ago that I was at this church that this happened in. But one thing we do know is that he will have to stand before the Lord and give an account of what he has done. 2 Corinthians 5.9 says, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleased, pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. These, this is about saved people. The, the judgment seat is not, this judgment seat that's being referred to here is not the judgment of whether we're saved or not. We're all saved and we're all squeaking by, but this is about how we're going to be received by God. Verses 7 and 8 of Hebrews 6. Now we're back to Hebrews 6 after that whole thing. Um, verses 7 and 8 continue in the same thought. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful by those, for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Excuse me. Notice that it says near to being cursed. It doesn't say that, the earth, that this is cursed. But, again, just squeaking by, the bare minimum required. Um, verse 9 talks about um, well, let me, let me read it, verse, uh, verse 9 and 10. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. 
So verse 9 talks about things accompanying salvation. Again, this isn't, we're not talking about uh, losing your salvation. We're talking about the things that accompany salvation and that in verse 10, God is watching and he's seeing our work and our labor of love and that we're doing things for him. Verse 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The, this is different for me to be reading because a lot of times we talk about what it, what it takes to be saved. And this is talking about what it takes to be a Christian, and it's serious business. It's a 24-hour-a-day thing. Like, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a really good American because I like my long weekends. I, I work a 410s job, so I get three days off, you know, and I like that, and I like to sleep in. Stephanie always has to get up with the kids, you know, she's cleaning and cooking and everything, and I'm still sound asleep. And, um, we, you know, we like the leaning on the everlasting arms, like the part that we talked about two Sundays ago, but when it comes to toiling in the fields, that's, I don't know about you, but that's not my thing. The toiling in the fields, I'm more of a resting, resting in Jesus type. But that's not really what this section is talking about. It's saying that every decision that I make should be based on what God would want me to do. And every dollar that I spend should be spent to glorify God. Not necessarily all on missions, but I mean, I think part of what I'm supposed to be doing is supporting my family. And if I'm spending that money on something, whatever, even if it's not like what you would think of as bad, when I go out and buy my Porsche 911 Twin Turbo tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and then my kids, they're going to have to skip a couple meals. But, you know, I don't think that God would, that, that would be in any way glorifying God. And every word that I say should be filtered through the test of will this please him. Every action that I should that I do, I should be thinking of what what effect does this have on my testimony to other people about what a Christ follower should be. And my overall goal should be to further God's kingdom and damage Satan's. And I know that every single day I don't live up to that. And that doesn't mean that I'm not saved. It means when I get to get heaven, Jesus is going to look at me and he's going to say, he's going to welcome me, but I, I think there might be a, a little bit of a wistfulness to his smile, like I had more planned for you, and it could have been so much better. But if I start to live like that, like what we're talking about, like, like living for Jesus, then when I get to heaven, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Hebrews 6, 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Notice that Abraham had to be patient, because God is faithful, but God is faithful in his own time. We get to look back and see this. So we have the added assurance of seeing, and especially the Jewish people would, would know, that God had fulfilled that both of both parts of that oath that he took. Verse 16, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end to all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So, like us, the Jewish people could see that God is faithful. And then verse 19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And like with the last chapter, this actually ends at the beginning of the first chapter, the next, or the next chapter, the next chapter is going to be talking about Jesus and comparing him to Melchizedek. Hebrews 11, 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. People talk about Christians blindly believing, but we know that there's evidence, and we can see it. They can't see it because their eyes are still closed, and we need to pray that their eyes will be opened, 
And we need to live in a way that makes them see that there's a difference between us and them. And I, I'm pretty convicted by this, and, and I hope that um, we can all agree to try to do that. And I'm going to close in prayer now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this book, for the book of Hebrews, and um, for the study of it, and that it's challenged me like it has. And I ask that you would help me to, to guard my testimony and to try to do things based on what would be pleasing to you first. And I ask that you would help us all with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us this morning.